Hi, my name is Kenny Smith. Um, I'm based in the Centre for Language Evolution at the University of Edinburgh. I'm going to present um, three experiments using artificial language learning techniques to study biases in kinship learning. Um, and I'm going to present results which suggest that simpler kinship systems are easier to learn and that the mistakes that learners make um, when learning kinship systems tend to um, increase simplicity at the expense of reducing communicative utility. This is joint work with um, Stella Frank, Sarah Rolando, Simon Kirby and Gia Loy and parts of it were funded by the European Research Council. So this work um, starts from the um, observation that natural languages seem to be optimal in that they um, are both um, simple, have low complexity, are uh, yet informative, so have low communicative cost. So this um, observation or conjecture has been made by um, various people including um, Terry Regeer and colleagues and we've also suggested something um, similar ourselves. So just to visualize this, um, this grey um, blob shows a space of logically possible languages that differ in their in complexity and communicative cost. So a language down in um, this region would be very useful for communication, has very low communicative cost, but very complex, has high complexity. Whereas a language up here um, is very simple, um, but is not very useful for communication, it has high communicative cost. It's also worth noting that there's some um, kind of shape to this blob. So it's just naturally the case that once you reduce complexity beyond a certain point, you start paying a cost um, for communicative functions. So as your language gets simpler and makes fewer and fewer distinctions, um, it becomes naturally becomes less useful for communication. And that's captured in the kind of shape in this bottom left-hand corner. So what this conjecture says, if we, um, we should expect natural languages to fall down in this region, i.e be um, both um, simple yet useful for communication or um, for a given level of complexity have the, the lowest communicative cost and for a given communicative cost have the lowest level of complexity. So that's quite abstract. Um, this has been demonstrated to be true in, in, in some domains of natural language. Um, for instance, in this um, paper by Kemp and Regeer looking at kinship systems. So a kinship system is the and vocabulary your language provides for talking about relationships to kin. So in English, kinship terms include things like um, mother, aunt, daughter, and so on. So um, what Kemp and Regeer do is measure the complexity and communicative cost of natural language kinship systems, and they show that they are indeed clustered around this optimal frontier of low complexity, low communicative cost. Okay, so what we're interested in is why um, languages are optimal in this way, what's enforcing this optimality. And there are a couple of suggestions out there in the literature. Um, one possibility which we, fa we favour is that um, this optimality is due to a trade-off between two distinct pressures um, arising during language learning and language use. So the idea is that during learning, uh, learners prefer um, simpler um, languages and that acts to reduce complexity over repeated episodes of learning. But when people come to use a language to communicate, they want the language to have low communicative costs. So it's language use that acts to drive down communicative cost. There is a, an alternative suggestion out there in the literature that has some experimental support, um, for instance, by um, in some papers by people like Masha Fejic-Kina or Alex Carstensen. And the idea is that uh, um, Maybe this optimality is actually entirely due to biases in learning. So the idea is that biases in learning act simultaneously to reduce um, complexity and also reduce communicative costs. So the idea is that biases in learning favor informative, simple languages. And we just want to know which of those two explanations is more likely to be true. Okay, so in this talk, we take kinship learning as a test case. Um, both because there's um, excellent um, cross-linguistic data available, but also because there are existing measures of complexity and communicative cost that we can just apply to our experimental data. We're going to run a series of artificial language learning experiments, so asking participants to learn an artificial kinship system. And our results suggest that learners favour simpler systems, so simple systems are easier to learn than more complex systems, but also the errors that people make during learning tend to reduce complexity. But those errors are, are at the same time blind to um, communicative cost. So 
errors uh, um, tend to reduce complexity, but, but have uh, tend to increase communicative cost, in fact, because simpler languages tend to have higher communicative cost. And the idea is that's consistent with the first of those two possible accounts for um, languages optimality. So learning seems to um, reduce complexity, um, but be relatively blind to the consequences for communicative utility. And that means that something else must be enforcing that requirement for low communicative cost, for instance, language use. Okay, so just before I get onto the details of our experiment, I want to flag up a related paper that just came out in Cognition by John Carr. So John makes the same sorts of arguments for um, categorization systems um, more generally. Okay, so to, now to um, uh, turn to how we measure complexity and communicative cost for kinship systems. So a kinship system provides you with a set of terms for referring to um, kin, so your siblings, your parents and their siblings, your grandparents, your children, your children's children, and so on. Um, you can imagine a very simple kinship system. So here I've shown a, a kinship system with three labels indicated by um, three colors. Um, so in this kinship system, um, you use the same uh, one label to refer to siblings. You use a second label to refer to parents and their siblings and also grandparents, so basically any ascending generation. And you use a third label to refer to your children, your children's children, and so on, any descending um, generations. So this is clearly very simple. There's very few labels um, to learn, but also those labels have very simple semantics. But clearly it has high communicative costs. It doesn't enable you to refer specifically to precise um, kin. You can contrast that with a, a, another extreme um, kind of kinship system where we have a distinct um, term for um, every kin relationship. So um, this clearly has high complexity. There's lots of labels to um, learn, but also those labels have quite um, complex semantics to enable them to pick out a specific um, relationship. But in return, this system has a low communicative cost. You can use it to talk really precisely about specific um, um, kin. Okay, so um, we're gonna um, use these kinds of measures to measure um, the complexity and communicative utility of the kinship systems in our experiments. We're gonna measure the number of labels that our participants produce. We're gonna measure the communicative cost of their labeling systems. And the communicative cost is just a measure of referential specificity. So how much additional information we needed on top of the label to know exactly who's being referred to. And then we're also gonna measure the semantic complexity of um, labels and sets of labels. And to do that, we borrow a technique from um, Moloch and Piantadosi, which involves um, taking some semantic primitives like parent, child, male, female, um, and, and using those semantic primitives, inferring an underlying lexical semantics for each kinship term. And so the idea is that you can capture the semantics of a kinship term by combining those um, primitives. Um, simple kinship terms will have relatively compressible, simple representations, Complex kinship terms and complex kinship systems will have much larger um, representations to capture their more complex semantics. Okay, so now I'll just talk you through our experimental paradigm briefly. So participants are asked to learn a kinship system for referring to members of this extended um, family. First of all, we have to familiarize participants with the family tree. So we do that um, without using kinship terms, so using the neutral terms parent and child. And we give participants many familiarization trials until they have a good understanding of the family tree. So for instance, on one, on one trial, you might see this is Mimi and Gon, Gon, Mimi and Gon have a child, Kiki. And that's enough to familiarize you with this little part of the family tree. We just repeat that process until participants have a good understanding of the overall family tree. Once participants are familiarized with the family tree, we then start training them on the kinship system. Participants get two kinds of um, training trials. They get production trials, it's all, tri it's all trial and error learning. So you get production trials where you see one individual greeting another individual and you have to guess which kinship term they're using and then you get feedback on your response. And you also get comprehension trials where you see an individual greeting someone and you get to see which label um, they're using and you have to guess who they're greeting. And again, you get feedback on your responses. So participants go through um, five blocks of training. The first four, four blocks are um, uh, trial and error learning, so you get feedback on your responses. The fifth block, there's no feedback. That's kind of our clean um, snapshot of what your kinship system looks like at the end of um, the training. Okay, so in the, in the paper we report the results for three experiments. Um, experiments one and two are, are, are basically um, the same thing, just run either in the lab or replicated online. In the interest of time, I'm just gonna show the results for 
um, of these two. I'm just going to show the results for experiment two, um, which replicates the results for experiment one. So in experiment two, we're interested in um, contrasting the learning of simple versus more complex 12 label kinship systems. So our simple system looks like this. It has 12 labels. Eight of those labels pick out unique relationships. Four of them are ambiguous. Um, so for instance, we use the same label for both maternal and paternal grandfather. We use the same label for maternal uh, and uh, uh, maternal aunt and maternal uncle. Um, paternal aunt, paternal uncle, sibling. Okay. So this um, uh, uh, kinship system has non-zero but quite low communicative cost. Um, and it has a compressed size to represent the semantics of the labels that require takes 253 bits. We're going to contrast how well participants learn that simpler 12 label system with a more complex 12 label system. So again, this has 12 labels. Four of those labels are two way ambiguous. So it has the same communicative cost, but the way the ambiguous labels are distributed is, is, is different and makes the system harder to, learn, to represent. Um, so we use the same um, label for, for instance, um, maternal grandfather, and paternal uncle, we use the same one label for um, paternal grandfather and grandson. So those labels have more complex semantics, which takes more space to um, represent, and that makes the system objectively more complex. It requires more bits to represent the lexical semantics. Okay, so this is the results for experiment two, showing um, time in blocks as participants are trained on the system against the proportion of correct responses on production trials for the simple kinship system in gray and the more complex system in orange. And what you see here is that the um, simpler kinship system is learned more rapidly and the final accuracy on that final test block is higher for the simpler um, kinship system than the complex kinship system. So the simpler system is easier to learn. We can also look at participants' responses in block five, that final test block, to see what kinds of errors they make. So this graph shows how many distinct labels participants produce during that um, final test block. Remember in the input, there was 12 distinct labels. And what you see is there's actually no difference between conditions, but in both conditions, participants are producing fewer labels than in their input. So they're simplifying the kinship system by um, dropping labels. As a result, that makes these um, kinship systems less useful for communication. So communicative cost increases in both conditions. So the input communicative cost is one third of a bit and participants tend to make mistakes which increase communicative cost. If we look at the um, compressed size of the inferred lexicons in both conditions, obviously there's a difference between conditions in the input and that's reflected in the and compressed size of the lexicons that participants produce during that final test. But in both conditions, participants are um, producing lexicons which have simpler lexical semantics. So again, their errors in learning tend to um, reduce complexity. And we find the same pattern of results in experiment one with lab participants. Okay, so what those results suggest is that simpler kinship systems are learned more accurately and errors that participants make in learning tend to decrease complexity and increase communicative cost. But there's one concern here that we might be seeing a kind of ceiling effect. So in this exp in experiments one and two, participants were trained on a 12 label kinship system, but when we tested them, we only give them 12 possible labels to choose from. And that means we're basically at the ceiling for the number of labels, and maybe that means that any errors are gonna involve dropping labels and therefore increase in communicative cost. So maybe those results are just a kind of ceiling effect on the number of available labels. So in order to um, check that, we run a third experiment, again online, where we train participants on an eight label system, but when we test them, they have all 12 labels available. So they could, if they wanted, introduce additional distinctions. So the eight label system looks like this, um, it has eight labels, nearly all of which are ambiguous. Um, and as a result, it has quite high communicative cost. But as I said, when participants are tested, they have the option to use up to 12 labels. Okay, so here's the results for um, accuracy during production trials over the course of the experiment. The experiment three results are just plotted alongside the others in blue. And what you see is that this even simpler kinship system is the most accurately learned of all three, and it's certainly more accurately learned than the complex 12 label system. If you look at the mistakes that participants make when learning this eight label system, 
um, what you see is that now they're producing roughly the right number of labels. So their input features eight distinct labels. Participants are on average producing seven or eight distinct labels. So they're not um, dropping labels. Very few participants um, increase the number of labels they use. Um, and participants are still increasing communicative costs. So once again, the errors that participants make make the language um, less useful for communication. They increase its communicative cost. Okay, so across those three experiments, our results suggest that simpler kinship systems are learned more accurately and that the errors that participants make during learning tend to decrease complexity while increasing communicative cost. So if we return to the question we um, started from, we think that um, our results speak in favour of this first um, trade-off based account for why languages um, reside on that optimal frontier of low complexity, low communicative cost. Our results suggest that errors in learning um, tend to reduce complexity without regard for the consequences for communicative cost. Therefore, there must be something else acting to drive down communicative cost. Okay, thank you.